So it's the last half of August today and I am on a landowner property here in southwest Michigan and today is planting day. So the landowner and I are going to uh, plant about three and a half acres of food plots. We're going to plant uh, rye, oats, and peas and then we're going to top dress that with uh, radishes and crimson clover. So today what we're going to do is uh, we're going to uh, broadcast right into some tall weeds and standing buckwheat. Uh, we're going to call to pack that down and then we're going to uh, spray uh, Roundup on it just to terminate it all. Uh, by that time it's probably going to be at the end of the day. We're going to let it set overnight and then come back in the morning and then we will uh, spray some liquid lime, liquid fertilizer and after that we're probably going to run over it again just with pure water at a really slow speed just to uh, get it as wet as possible because uh, the 10 day forecast doesn't show really any rain here for probably at least the next seven days so it's going to be very important to get this nice and wet um, the liquid lime and liquid fertilizer is going to give it a jump right away, much faster than what granular can do. And so with the added water afterwards, it should really keep it wet with that mat of um, you know, biomass on top of it. And then at that point, uh, it should really uh, take off pretty good. So we're going to take a lot of video today, and we'll share a lot of that footage with you here in this video. So just to give you an overview of this property and why food plots here are so important is you can see that on this about 160 acre property, uh, we have a lot of water, a lot of swamp, a lot of edge. Uh, you can see a lot of these little peninsulas, really defined elevation changes here as well. You can see here, this is a high spot and it goes down to the swamp. A lot of cattails, deer can actually cross through here. Uh, but when the water's high, you know, they may not go through there as uh, quickly. It is high in the spring, not so much so, though, in the fall. Uh, but you can see you got another, you know, big lake down here, more cattails, swamp edge, uh, you know, just swamp grass. Got an island here. We got an island there. We got a peninsula here, another peninsula here. High ground right here where we got food plot, a food plot here, and a little, a little finger right down in this area you know more swamp over in here so there's just a ton of edge on this property and you know buck movement should be fairly predictable on this property but you know we're going to have to hunt this thing uh, very carefully because uh, you know there's not much room for error because you know a lot of this 160 acres is taken up by water and swamp hunting this property in the wrong spots at the wrong time the landowner is really going to be able to sour this property pretty quickly. So going to have to hunt this thing very smart. He's got quite a few neighbors here that touch his property along the west side. He's got a few here along the east side, but this is pretty much impassable because of the, uh, the deep water and the swamp grass and the cattails. It's just pretty much no man's land. Just a great place for mature bucks to uh, survive and get away from the uh, orange army. These little fields down here is pretty much alfalfa just hay fields you know nothing real attractive here in november either so you know he's going to be basically feeding deer by himself and so these food plots have to produce and without this food here it's going to um, probably result in deer seeking greener pastures with uh, you know other guys that are planting food plots or maybe some late standing ag fields next year we may be able to add a little bit of food right over in this area here right now this is all real thick area it's kind of on a high spot, but there's a lot of deer bedding in here. And so, you know, because there's so much other opportunities for deer to bed on this property, they don't need to be bedding right here like by the food plot because this is basically restricting his access from getting in and out of here over on this side because of all this bedding that's taken over. So it's a lot of autumn olive and just a lot of, like, you know, good cover for deer to bed in here. So what we're going to do probably next year is grab a forestry mulcher, come in here. We're going to grind all this out of here, turn this into more food, and that'll give the landowner another opportunity to hunt some uh, food plot edges at the right time and uh, take away the bedding so that he can actually get in and out of here and then come down here along the uh, east side here along the river to get some more access. So... This food plot right here is about a three acre total. Uh, this one here is about two and a half acres and this one here is uh, not even an acre. So we've got to make the most of the ground that we have available and just make sure that we've got good food well into the season. 
And the food plot that we're going to be planting today in this video is going to be this uh, three acre uh, field right here. This is actually a low spot in the field and this is high ground right up in here. So the other thing I just want to mention real quick here is you'll see the uh, orange and red stars and, and we got the white stars. So what that is, is the orange stars are stand locations where the landowner can hunt any time of the season but these red stars are hunting locations that he should not hunt until the pre-rut starts around October 26. That's when he can finally get into the red stars. Um, this is out on a peninsula. You know, there's just no way and no reason to come out here during the early season in October because uh, there's just too much mature buck movement uh, real close and there's too much bedding around here, so it's just way too risky to try and get in and out of these uh, islands and peninsulas in the early season. So this is something that he's definitely going to want to hunt during the pre-rut, late October, early November, when those mature bucks are putting a lot more miles on their feet. And so he'll be able to sneak in here in the early morning, get up into the stand. And then uh, all these white stars here, these are cellular trail cam locations. So basically going to let these uh, cell cams tell him when the activity really starts to pick up and then it'll be time to move into these red stands. So you can see the uh, hard to get places are where the red stands are and then the orange locations are the places where it's easy to get to and fairly simple to get in and out undetected so that he's not tipping off deer to the fact that this property is being hunted. So now that you know how this property sets up a little bit, let's get back to planting food plots. Normally in the fall when I broadcast seed into tall vegetation, I usually walk it with a hand seeder or I use an ATV with a front mounted spreader. But in this case, neither one was an option because the horse nettle and the ragweed and the foxtail and everything else just totally took over this buckwheat. So luckily the landowner had this utility box which really worked out great. And there was really no way you could walk through this stuff without tripping and falling every step. So. Once we got done with that, then I was able to jump on the ATV with the front mounted spreader and was able to broadcast the crimson clover and the radish right into the rows that we ran down originally. And this worked out really, really well. And then the landowner followed behind me with the tractor and the cultipacker and rolled everything down. And as you can see, the ragweed is sticking far above anything else. It uh, really took over this whole plot. So. The guy that planted this field in the spring really didn't get a good kill before he planted buckwheat and so this is the result it just pretty much totally took over but in other areas of the plot you can see here we got a little bit uh, better percentage of buckwheat on the ground but still if you look off to the left there you can see a lot of that ragweed is sticking far above the buckwheat. Now even though this cultipacker is doing a really good job on laying everything down and keeping it down, for ATVs I would opt rather to have like a lawn roller, you know a smooth roller, where it's going to crease every stem flat to the ground much better than something that's got ribs on it. The other thing too is when you're doing no-till you want to press that seed into the ground. If you had a roller it's going to come in contact and push more of the seed down rather than something with ribs on it. So once all the vegetation was rolled down, it was time to terminate it with 41% glyphosate. And since we wanted to make this a little bit more of a hot mix because of all the weeds, we went with three quarts per acre instead of the regular two quarts per acre. And since the plot is three acres, we had to go with nine quarts total of glyphosate and put that in 90 gallons of water because the sprayer will cover one acre with 30 gallons of water. The spray boom on this tractor is about 18 feet wide and it's cranked up to about 100 pounds of pressure and it really does a nice job. If you're wondering what that white stuff is he's dropping off the end, that's really nothing more than white soapy foam and it makes a nice straight line at the end of the boom so that when he gets to the end of the field and he turns around, he can just put that orange flag right over top of the white foam dots and it keeps him right on track and it makes sure that he doesn't skip anything and gives him a nice even coverage. On a hot day like today, that Roundup is dry in less than 30 minutes, so we were able to drain the tank, fill it back up again with uh, water and liquid fertilizer, and right here I'm pouring liquid lime into a bucket of water because this stuff is so thick that it really has to be stirred up and get suspended 
into a bucket of water so that when you go to pour it in the big tank, it's not all going to sink to the bottom. That way it's going to stay suspended, and that way too you have less chance of the lime clogging up your nozzles. So as you can see here, I was able to get it in there without spilling, and it cleaned out that bucket real well. What I'm putting in now is one quart of calcium from Plot Doctor, which is where I get all these liquid products from. And calcium really helps to promote root growth and it helps protect the plant in times of drought. We were having such a good time planting food plots that we almost forgot to fill the tank up the rest of the way. So we had to put the hose back in, get it filled up, and it was back out onto the field. We had to fill the tank up all the way because when you spray liquid lime, fertilizer, and calcium over top of vegetation, you're going to want really good coverage and so it's going to take more water per acre than it does when spraying Roundup. And so when we got done with this, then we also went over it again with just pure water just to really get it saturated. Then seven days later I came back to see how everything was doing and it looks like we got a really good kill. So when I peeled back a bunch of that dead thatch laying on top, uh, looks like we got some pretty good germination. Looks like in this spot we got uh, a few peas that have germinated already and are starting to send up some shoots. And so everything is looking real good. It was nice and moist underneath that mat. It was early in the morning and uh, we hadn't had any rain yet really to speak of. So. I was really encouraged to see that all that horse nettle and ragweed and foxtail and grasses had all died and it was really providing a nice layer of protective mulch over top of all that seed. Then I arrived back again on September 16, which is 27 days after planting. And boy, you can see that we've got a lot of greenery pushing through that dead mat. You can see all the radishes and the peas and the rye and especially the haywire oats. It's a new strain of oats that I wanted to try this year and it's far outpacing everything out there. A friend of mine who planted haywire oats on August 1st already has his at a full three feet tall. But since this stuff was growing so fast, I really needed to get a trail camera out there. So I mounted a little browning dark ops in video mode to the bottom of the shadow hunter, which is not concealed. This blind is sitting wide out in the open. so. We're going to have to address that next year but it is what it is this year and uh, since this little camera is 12 feet off the ground no deer is going to see it especially since it's a blackout so the following week which would be five weeks after planting i showed back up again to spread another 300 pounds of winter rye grain on this three acre food plot and so this is really going to give this food plot another wave of fresh growth which is going to last longer into the hunting season the deer are going to paw through the snow to get at this rye all winter long and it'll also be the first thing to green up in the spring and then also become really tall in May and June and provide some excellent fawning cover. So now that it's been a week I'm going to pull the card and see what kind of action we've had here on this food plot. So this is what it looks like every day and we're only looking at a third of the food plot. Looks like the landowner is going to need to shoot some does to balance the herd out a bit. That will preserve his food plots longer into the season, reduce social stress, make his property easier to hunt, and make for a more intense rut when you have fewer does to go around. I've been getting a lot of texts and emails from landowners concerned about not seeing any mature bucks yet. But don't worry, when you have plenty of cover, good food and water, and a low amount of human intrusion, you will see more bucks from your stands.